Hello and welcome viewers and subscribers of AVG News. My name is Mtholi Singube. Uh, we are discussing here the new scramble for Africa and I am joined by Mr. Ian Bettos, the National Commissar of the Zimbabwe Communist Party, who is going to help us uh, unpack the new scramble for Africa between the West and the East. Mr. Bettos, welcome to the show. Uh, hello and uh, hello to everybody who's watching or listening. Um, um, the new scramble for Africa, uh, what do you read of it? Well, it's a little bit complex because what's happened is that uh, the European powers uh, occupied Africa uh, both to export capital and for raw materials. Now, uh, in the past few years, um, we have to try and understand this. Europe and America has followed the neoliberal course of development or underdevelopment because neoliberalism, which hit Zimbabwe badly in 1991 with ESAP, means that you put money before production. Now, China didn't follow that course. China uh, worked on production. In, in China, production comes before money. And as the uh, industry develops, so they need more raw materials. And uh, even although the Soviet Union was destroyed, um, under Putin, they're now again geared towards production rather than simply making money by buying and selling money. And they also need raw materials. Now, we've got the stage where the West is starting to wake up as well. Uh, we're hearing, for instance, that in Zimbabwe, uh, because of the expense of the war against Russia, which is taking place in, in Ukraine, which is being funded by NATO, and especially by European countries, more than the United States, which is the, the main protagonist, um, they're facing severe economic problems. And what we're hearing now is that the, the British government is now talking to the Zimbabwe government about rejoining the Commonwealth and establishing uh, business here, because they realize that China, which never put Zimbabwe under sanctions, or any other African country under sanctions, is reaping the benefits through, um, through minerals, um, uh, getting all, all the minerals that, that they want. So there's some complexity here. Also, you, you see, in the West, we had the uh, economic downturn in 2008. Yes. And they're now just starting to wake up and realising that monetarism, which is the economic part of neoliberalism, doesn't work in the long term. A few people make a lot of money in the short term. But now, uh, if you have banks which don't produce anything, which are at the top of the food chain, where's the production? Um, and, for instance, the, the big name coming out of the United States, although he's born in South Africa at the moment, is Elon Musk. Elon Musk is not following the neoliberal way. He's not a banker. He's actually producing uh, cars. He's being productive. He's a productive capitalist. So sometimes people confuse capitalism and neoliberalism. Before the neoliberal um, uh, agenda, which started uh, with the election of uh, Margaret Thatcher in 1979 in Britain and Reagan in the United States in 1981, after a lot of manipulation of, of, of the media. Uh, before that, you had what we call Keynesian economics, yes, led after yes. John Keynes. And even capitalist countries realize that for stability, you need a certain number of nationalized industries. Uh, Neoliberalism turned against that. Everything must be deregulated. The market forces will decide everything. And yeah, what we've got is economic uh, catastrophe worldwide, apart from those countries which didn't follow the, the, the neoliberal pattern. 
Uh, and you see now Latin America, by and large, has broken away from the whole of the United States. Um, and it's now starting to wake up. So as well as China and Russia, whose economies are developing, having an interest in African resources, uh, Europe and America are rethinking and thinking, oh, oh, oh putting sanctions and creating wars, at the end of the day, people have turned against us. So uh, we're, we're now in the process where everybody is looking for African minerals. The question now is, how do we deal with this as Africans? Yes, my, my next question was, uh, how does Africa get to benefit from this? Is it for the good or is it for the better or the worse for Africa that there is now a new scramble for Africa? Well, that's a two-edged sword. First of all, uh, most of our African leaders have shown that they're totally incapable of running an economy. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, where we've had leaders who are capable, they've been removed from power. Uh, Gaddafi being a famous one, Thomas Sankara. Uh, we've just seen that the, the the problem now, the release of the killer of Chris Hani. We're very clear, those of us who live in South Africa, had Chris Hani been the next president after Mandela, uh, he was not at all corrupt. He was very anti-corruption uh, and he was not a neoliberal. So the kind of problems that have been created by, by the neoliberal system uh, would not have happened, at least not on the same scale. Uh, we saw in, in Zimbabwe, we had the blocking of Joshua Nkomo and the killing of uh, Josiah Tongogara. We, again, I'm not saying things would have been perfect if they'd have been the leadership, but certainly much better than, uh, than, than, than they have been. So uh, as much as we've got bad leaders, I don't want to be seen to be saying that all African leaders are bad. Simply, when we get any leader... Who, who has challenged the West and has challenged Western hegemony, he's removed, he's removed one way or the other, very often by, by, by murder. Um, so what we need is an African leadership which is going to have planned production. Now, when we have, in Zimbabwe, we've had no production at all. Now, the reality on the ground is that mines are opening up in Zimbabwe. Yes. A lot of them very badly paid. But what are the workers doing? They're not saying we can't work for those mines because they don't want to pay us. They're going there because some work is better than no work. So it's better to have some production, even badly paid production, than no production. But... We can't just go there and accept meekly low wages. Our job, and especially for us as communists, we're talking to trade unions at the moment, if we're brave, we must have cadres who are going to go into the mines and to organize the trade unions and fight for better wages. And if the British do open factories, same thing if they open factories. We have to unionize the people. And if you know the real history of the Zimbabwe struggle, it wasn't started by our so-called chefs, uh, these uh, wannabe capitalists, these guys uh, who push Marxism and Leninism away once independence came. No, it was started by the workers. There's absolutely no question about it. The 1948 general strike, the, the reorganization of the Southern Rhodesian African National Congress in 1957, it was done by the workers. But now we let these other guys come and take over because we weren't clear what we do next. Yeah. We need uh, a planned economy. Yes. Uh, and okay. Uh, I, I, I just want to say, Okay, okay, you can continue. I, I just want to say that, and we've seen the benefits of a planned economy by people who we consider their enemy, the Rhodesians. The Rhodesians, for all their racism, 
when they were put under sanctions, planned the economy, uh, albeit for the interests of trying to maintain the settler rule. But they had a planned economy and we saw the benefits of it and we kept that for the first 11 years of independence. And our black government threw economic independence away with ESAP. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to ask this. Um, we are talking about the scramble for Africa, the new scramble for Africa. There is the West on one side, there is the East on the other. And you've lived in Africa for so long. Which side do you think stands to benefit Africa? Let's say Africa is given, in this dichotomy, is given a choice. Who would you want Africa to, 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 nav to gravitate towards? Uh, for myself, definitely towards the East, but, and there's a big but, yes. we can't just accept uh, swap a Western hegemony for Chinese hegemony. Yes. Um, in, in the end, if you follow what China has been doing, their government-to-government -government agreements have been much better than those given to us by the West. They've forgiven debt on a much bigger scale, uh, and they've built infrastructure. Nevertheless, we're very aware that Chinese companies have got a very bad reputation on their treatment yes. of workers. Um, so it's not just... So we have the problem among Zimbabweans and thinking that someone else is going to come and do it for us. The central issue is that we have to do it for ourselves, and we have to create... Um, management and people forget when they talk about workers and capitalists they forget about the question of management um, and by the way uh, people who don't understand communism think we're not worried about management if you read Lenin and Stalin they're very very concerned about proper management and uh, this thing of we put cadres which is like a communist word those are not cadres. They are, it's, it's a cover word in Africa for nepotism. Um, what the Soviet Union did in 1918, it is relevant to what's happening in Africa today. Uh, they nationalized all the manufacturing companies, but they kept the old management boards. And all they did was to put, to put a cadre on each board. But Lenin was very clear. We don't know how to manage factories. All we're going to do is supervise what the professional managers are doing. Not put the whole... And what we've seen in Africa is sometimes the other way around. They get one or two expats who are knowledgeable, and the rest of the board is made up by people's relatives. Um, so we have to have proper management. It doesn't matter whether the manager is white or black or colored or Indian or Russian or Chinese or even American, it doesn't matter, as long as that person is working for the benefits of the company. And if it's a nationalized company uh, and it's properly run, it means that money is going to go back into the fiscus because ownership and management are two different things, um, especially more so in, in, in the modern world where uh, big capitalists don't manage anything. They buy and sell money. So the, the, the key people are the managers. And what we want is professional managers who are going to manage state-owned enterprises or 50-50-owned enterprises on behalf of the people of Zimbabwe. Uh, in the current state of Africa, do or you any think other Africa. that is possible? Everything is possible if we work for it. It's not just going to happen. <laughs> yeah. It's not just going to happen. And we, we, we have a, a huge problem of uh, people being taught everybody must work for him, must do what he thinks is best for him, him or herself. In the 80s in Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans were very productive. And when they didn't have anything, because... Uh, 
Forex was just what we earned. The, the Zim dollar couldn't be bought and sold. Yes, there were shortages, but people found ways around the shortages and people were inventive and they used to make a lot of stuff themselves and the economy was thriving. Yes, there were, I'm not saying it was perfect. There were problems. Once we got into ESAP and the market economy, so-called, place was flooded with, with foreign goods and industry closed down. As our industry was closing down, what did we do? We opened indigenous banks. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Um, so the key word is production. Yeah, you've already so, mentioned the, the limitations of African leaders. And one of the outcries is that because China doesn't interfere with the political setup of a country, these guys are taking advantage. That's why they are gravitating towards China, because it will not tell them how to run their country. Yet, because of the nature of the African politics, we need this sort of an overseer in our politics from the, those that we deal with, especially those that give us money like the West donating to us. Do you think uh, it's a... It would work for the the, the, the last people we, we the last people we need to oversee us are the West. The and why French is that have, so? The French have removed so many good leaders in in Africa, and uh, if you talk to anybody from Francophone Africa, where the French have overseen it, you think we're badly off in Anglophone Africa. They're much worse off. Let me give you an uh, example: Cote d'Ivoire. Which was led by Ufwe Bwani, uh, who was uh, a real, he was a black guy, but loved everything to do with French culture. Now, the, the, now the big uh, export of uh, Cote d'Ivoire is cocoa for making chocolate. Yes, yes. And I saw a video only made a couple of years ago where the guys who were growing chocolate or growing the cocoa pods were handed around a bar of chocolate. They'd never tasted chocolate. They didn't even know what their crop was going for. Yeah. And uh, this is, so uh, where there's been more over, over, oversight from the West, that's when we get our good leaders removed. No, people, our best leaders were those who were believed in developing Africa. Gaddafi, was removed very violently. Um, we, we had Chris Hani was killed. Thomas Sankara was killed. These were people who were looking for the interests of the people. As you know, uh, Joshua Ngoma was, was sidelined. And for all his later anti-Western rhetoric, Mugabe and Zanu were, were put there with the approval of the British and the Americans. In, in fact, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who was an ideological neoliberal, uh, Reagan wasn't. Reagan was just a film actor who's being controlled from 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 behind. Yes. Thatcher was an ideological neoliberal. When Thatcher died, Mugabe mourned. <laughs> yes, yes, that was very surprising to those of us who are anti-imperialist. So we have to do it for ourselves. We can look at Latin America, and in particular, I'd say, look at Bolivia, yes. where they've managed their own economy very well. And by the way, their president is a Marxist economist, uh, Louis Arce. Uh, he was, and when previously uh, 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 Evo Morales was president, he was the minister of finance. And even the World Bank and IMF said, hey, but these guys are doing well because they built their economy at the same time they reduced poverty. Yeah. And, then, and they had the support. Of yeah. And then quickly, uh, there is the US-China summit coming up where 45 heads of state from Africa have been invited. There are others that have been left behind. What do you make of this? And what do you think is the reason behind this leadership summit? Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting what they're doing, but, um, I, 
I'll be very honest. I, I don't have any great trust in most of the African leaders. Mm. Uh, I, like to i'd be more interested to, to know um apart from that the uh, the the country which has maintained at least some semblance of independence since the independence war is algeria yes. uh, apart from that most of them are uh, i have uh, you know to me they it doesn't now I'm part of a movement which is still very small, a communist and communist and pan-African movement. It's yes. not just looking at communists of China or the Soviet Union, as much as we appreciate what those countries have, have what's been accomplished by those countries. We're looking to create a new pan-Africanism based on the ideas not only of Marx and Lenin, but of Kwame and Krum, because despite the fact that he, he took a, a, a neutral stance, uh, Kwame and Krum was a scientific socialist and said so. Um, and he was trying The older leaders we have, have to. We have to. We have to go back and see our better leaders, but we have to be even better than them, because they did make errors. We have to understand what were their errors, and we have to go forward, and we have to study scientifically our own uh, position and what is possible. But most of all, we cannot do it unless we train young Africans who are politically conscious uh, and are not only out there for themselves, are willing to sacrifice in order to build the economies of their countries. Okay. Um, and then you've already spoken about Zimbabwe having reapplied to be readmitted in the, into the Commonwealth. And we were just a few weeks ago, we saw some comments where they were saying that there's some progress being made by Zimbabwe, uh, meaning that a green light might be given. But we already know that the opposition in Zimbabwe is being uh, accused of being funded by the West. How do you think this is going to pan out if Zimbabwe is readmitted into the Commonwealth? Well... The the op the main opposition in Zimbabwe is becoming uh, obsolete. Triple C, MDC, Triple C is become, becoming obsolete because uh, Zonu PF and the leadership of Munangagwa is actually just taking over their ground. Yeah. So uh, uh, we we need a genuine opposition, and one of the problems that we had. Uh, in my view, as a scientific socialist, as a Marxist-Leninist, long term, people imagine that Marxist-Leninists, the guys running around the bush with AKs. Well, that was necessary. Guerrilla war was necessary. But the, the core of, of, of Marxism in terms of development is economic. So basically, and some of them even admitted it, once they got arms from the East, and they'd overthrown the, the white settler governments, then they just forgot about Marxism and how you develop an independent economy. And they took on, uh, uh, we, 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 we saw in, in, in Zimbabwe, we've seen Bernard Chidzero, and then on television, we used to get people like Eric Bloch, and what, what's this guy, John Robertson, I think his name yes. or something like that. this guy, uh, Nube, all of them follow European textbooks or American textbooks, which, by the way, were made, became obsolete with the crash of 2008. So they're just, they're just following 
textbooks without understanding the economies of their own country and how they operate. And Ian Smith, I'm sorry, well, I, I, I'm, I've always been a support of the liberation movement, but Smith and, and the, the white Rhodesians understood how the economy of, of what was then Rhodesia, how it operated. Our guys, they don't. They just go to a textbook. And textbooks which became obsolete after the crash of 2008 and have been shown to be useless because of the way that China has advanced over the US and over Europe and even how Russia is, is advancing. And by the way, even Russia, uh, although it's modern Russia is controlled by oligarchs to a large extent, but, it's, but this current war has moved, at least made it move back towards what we call state monopoly capitalism, to state ownership of at least some leading enterprises. The day of the, the free market economy, even in Russia, has gone. <laughs> so now, if you want production, you have to have planning. The, the neoliberal uh, uh, agenda is over. And so you must understand things Properly now, like I said, the workers led the struggle uh, in the 1950s and set up the the armed struggle was set up by the working class. And after ESAP, it was the trade unions, the workers again, who said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! This thing is not good." And you had the initiative for uh, which led to the movement for democratic change and uh, National People's Convention, which had very good ideas. But as soon as the MDC was formed, uh, who became the economic spokesperson? Eddie Cross, a neoliberal who's now supporting Emerson Munigagwa. So it's no use struggling and saying we don't need theory because you, you, if you don't have theory, What's going to happen is that you, you will end up having struggled for nothing or for very little. Yeah. So, so you, you need theory to know where you're going and how to organize the economy and see who has, from a poor base, has built up their economy. And the Soviet Union was extremely poor. It's a country which was the same size as the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, they built their economy in a very few years. And modern Russia is the beneficiary of that. China, the same. Cuba, under sanctions, has got, uh, with almost no natural resources like Zimbabwe, has got free education and free health, despite all the restrictions. Bolivia in Latin America, because it's got led by a Marxist economist, the economy is growing. When there was a right wing coup, it, it, it couldn't survive. And, and yeah, the, the, the progressive elements are, are, are back in power and the country is developing. So Marxism tells you how to examine the particular uh, concrete. Uh, conditions of the country you're in and what should be the next step and we've got examples good and bad of what you can do effectively and what you can't do and then you'll also get a number of homegrown remedies uh, which we have to look at which would be appropriate to each and every country and how can Africa leverage the new scrim there's the West is this side just in the next five minutes because we are left with five minutes. How can Africa leverage the new scramble of Africa? Well, it's the African people who will have to do that. <laughs> it's not going to come from the African leadership. Yeah. It's not going to come from the leadership of most of these current African countries. It's not. And this is why I'm saying... Um, the Zimbabwe Communist Party is relatively new, formed in 2017. But I think we've got the political high ground 
in Zimbabwe at the moment, people are starting to listen to us because what we're saying is practical. Um, we're still quite small. Kenya, there's a communist party now. Uh, Swaziland, they're, uh, uh, they're leading the struggle against the absolute monarchy. Um, even in South Africa, people are now saying, uh, I've had someone come to me and say, no, the SACP, especially under leadership now of Solim Apaila, is much clearer than, 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 than anybody else. And we're going to get these movements across, uh, across Africa. Um, they may not all be called communist parties as, as such, but there's a new mood amongst the younger people in Africa, and we are going to change things. We're going to look at African conditions. Uh, even if they say they're, they're socialist, uh, as much as, like I said, we prefer the Eastern Bloc because they haven't bombed us and created yes. wars like the Americans and the British and the French. They haven't massacred our people. But still, we're not going to let uh, Chinese or Russian business people do what they want with our workers. We're going to stand up and say, no, our workers must be properly paid. Uh, but at the end of the day, we must organize our own production. This is the point of it. And where necessary, we can do 50-50 agreements with Western or Eastern companies, with foreign companies. We can do 50-50 agreements, but we must be in control. This is the basic thing. And we need the younger generation to wake up and, and to realize what is the next step. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That is uh, Ian Petos. He is the National Commissar of the Zimbabwe Communist Party. We hope to have him because he is a reservoir of knowledge when it comes to politics and the political economy. We hope that uh, he will be available again next week uh, or any other day to discuss these kinds of issues especially the new scramble for Africa because it's gaining momentum and we know that uh, some of these African countries are now uh, torn into conflict, which uh, is being believed to be coming from Western countries uh, because they fear that China is taking over. Also, the war in Ukraine has kicked up say, some form of dust and it has even added to this kind of uh, scramble that we are seeing. Thank you, Mr. Ian Petros. We hope again that we'll talk again next week or any day that you are free.